For those of you who are guests today or those watching who haven't tuned in before or not for a while, our remarks this morning may feel a little unusual or uh, you may not really understand what we're addressing. But we are speaking today to the decision made by our leadership council on Tuesday evening of this last week to indefinitely rest one of the four embroideries that hangs in Guild Hall, the summer embroidery called the Summer of the First Amendment. For several weeks leading up to the Leadership Council's meeting on Tuesday, June 14th, clergy have been asked about our perspectives regarding the summer embroidery. Contrary to what some people believe, clergy have not stated publicly our personal feelings about whether to rest the fall or the summer embroideries. One can certainly make assumptions of our feelings based on the messages we preach and what we say at board meetings and working groups. Yet we intentionally did not speak out in a public way during our process in 2019 when we were deciding about the fall embroidery. I am not here to defend or offer regret for that decision. It was not requested of us then. It has been requested of us now. Therefore, the three of us all made a statement on Tuesday night after every leadership council member present had been invited to speak and share their feelings and the feelings of the board they represent. The three of us spoke in the order that we are speaking to you today, and following the meeting and that vote, in order to be transparent, we felt it was important for all of you, for our community, to hear what fills our hearts over the matter of the embroideries, which is why we pivoted quickly in our plans for today and are standing before you in this way. Our remarks will be brief, and we invite any of you to engage us in respectful conversation about our perspectives in the days to come. The Leadership Council meeting on Tuesday evening opened with our scripture text this morning, followed by a unison reading of the purposes of the church. In most Bibles, Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 18, comes with the heading, Marks of a True Christian, or guidelines for Christian living. I've always thought these words are as covenant to life together in community, rules for our communal spiritual life, and best practices for decision-making, conflict mediation, and right relationship. So oh, please open your hearts and your minds for the reading of Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 18. Let love be genuine, hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection, outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal, be ardent in spirit, serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in affliction, persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints, Pursue hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be arrogant, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. This is the word of God, and I believe it can be trusted. I hope it comes as no surprise that I approach the process and decision regarding the embroideries from a pastoral care perspective. 
You may tire of my constant mantras. It's all about relationship, and everyone has a story, and every story is sacred. Yet one of the gifts of this discernment process is that we have heard a lot of stories. Stories about what it was like to gather weekly and to bond with other women over needle and thread. How those times together were life-sustaining and the relationships the needlers built became for many of them a saving grace. We have heard stories of the pride people felt to show off these extraordinary pieces of art to family members and guests knowing that Plymouth women had created these one-of-a-kind pieces. We have heard about how the embroideries were featured in national publications and documentaries, and we have heard that even with all the celebration around each finished embroidery, some of the needlers felt their work not taken seriously, their artisanship reduced to craft rather than art their honor as women diminished in this congregation. Stories of both pride and pain. We have also heard the stories of many, not just a few, but many, about how some of the images in the embroidery cause deep visceral pain representations of people of color inconsistent with reality, caricatures that have been used for centuries to tell an untrue story, reminders, regardless of intention, of slavery and lynchings, capitalist power and manifest destiny, trauma-inducing imagery. And with each of these testimonies comes the overwhelming question about whether one feels safe in a space that proclaims to welcome all and amplify love. I recently had a conversation with a member of Plymouth, a member this congregation sent out into the world ordaining their gifts for ministry and promising our continued support, who has not come back to Plymouth because they are unable to reconcile the embroidery images and the messages of Black Lives Matters and all are welcome here that also hang on our walls. As a person of color, they said, I do not know if I am safe at Plymouth anymore. Plymouth, their home church. Instead, they feel betrayed and unwelcome. When people use the word trauma, my pastoral ears open and my tender heart breaks. I trust that none of us take that word lightly nor use it lightly. And for me to know that the images in the summer embroidery induce a traumatic response in some leads my pastoral heart to question how do we offer care? How do we begin the necessary work of repair and restoration? We offer care by removing hurtful imagery. We offer care by aligning our purposes with our actions. We offer care by living into our mission that everyone is welcome here. We offer care by making tangible change to become a safe space. I believe we must rest the summer embroidery because to not do so would be contrary to the purposes of the church and we would therefore become yet another church that cannot be trusted. We must rest the summer embroidery and begin the harder work of repair and restoration. To let our love be genuine, as scripture states, we must be open to change and we must risk loss. Needlers, I will continue to offer care to you with a heart filled with gratitude for your exquisite art and for your devotion to one another. 
I know many of you do not yet trust this, but resting the summer embroidery is not an indictment of you. Instead, it is a necessary action for Plymouth to truly be who we say we are, a spiritual community fueled by love, honoring of each other, a safe space for authentic relationship grounded in God's grace. <clears throat> Friends, Almost four years ago, I stood right here and I preached a sermon that formally began this church's conversation about imagery that were presented in two of the embroideries that were hung in Guild Hall. It was not the beginning of the conversation, but it was the formal start. And since that time, I have shown up to dozens scores, hundreds of hours of conversations. I've acted as a facilitator, a teacher, a listener, a consultant, and a pastor. I myself, along with some dedicated volunteers, show up and put up and store the embroideries. I lead that. These pieces of art have taken a large piece of my own work life in ways that I hadn't anticipated. And in all that time, as Beth said, I have never publicly communicated my own thoughts, and it feels kind of strange to pivot and do that today. So this will be necessarily brief and therefore not full. So I am happy to talk with anyone about anything said or not said. I urge us unequivocally to support the resting of the summer embroidery indefinitely. I often show up here with the identity of your minister, but what you might not know is that in my mind, I have a co-equal identity as a theater artist. As an artist, and a facilitator of arts, I see as foundational the impact that art can have on individuals and communities. Impact is the goal of art. Art is created to place something before you, inside you, surround you, a story or feeling that impacts you in one way or another. And therefore, only the impact of art can be evaluated. Intention may be the engine of the creation, but once it leaves your hands, your voice, or your body, all that remains is impact. And the impact of several images in the summer embroidery cause hurt. They remind people of their generational or their historical traumas. And it reminds me personally of, of the lies that I have been taught to distract me from the genocide and the enslavement and the patriarchal colonization that I have inherited. I cannot change what has been done, but I can be responsible for what we do about it now. Art is not meant to be permanent. Art is meant to tell a story for a purpose, and when that story is no longer helpful, then we begin again. And we present art that tells the story that we wish to tell, that we wish to live. That is the gift and the struggle of art making. And the world has changed and churches are no longer enjoy the privilege of being trusted places in our community. I don't know if you know this. Churches being trusted is no longer the default. We must now earn our trust. 
We must actively and continually work to prove that we are reliable, that we are trustworthy, and that this particular community will not, and that we will not minimize or marginalize or dehumanize people. We have to do that work. I am in conversations weekly, daily, with potential and active partners in which I am continually asked to prove our trustworthiness, to represent our commitment to abundant love, not just by what we say, but what we do. And I do not know how to authentically indicate our trustworthiness if we choose to hang this particular piece of art while having heard the impacts of several of its images. Anytime you put yourself out there and present something boldly, you run the risk that the impact will not be what you intended. This is the inherent risk and power of art. And this is what we do every week from this pulpit, and this is what we are doing today. It doesn't mean that you stop being bold or avoid having impact. Instead, it means that you do so and then you act in love, kindness, and compassion in hoping, in praying that your impact matched your intention. It means listening when you hear otherwise. And ultimately, it means saying you're sorry when you've caused hurt and asking, what can we do to make it better? This morning, as I do every Father's Day, I look at the pictures of my own father and I wanted to tell him that I am a historic first, the first black minister of Plymouth Congregational Church. The success of historic firsts has mixed results. I am aware of it every day that I come to work and every day that I stand before you. You see, I have been conditioned all of my life to see my body as a problem. The black body is an object of fear and vilification, for it has been in the American imagination and the Christian social imagination, a chattel body, an animalized body, a hypersexualized body, a dangerous body, in most recent years, a criminal body. Accordingly, I, throughout my life, especially my professional life, I, I have had to do what many people of color are trained to do. If I wanted to survive or succeed, I had to understand and discern every mood, manner, and motion of white people. So this morning, my every instinct in these types of discussions is to avoid it. My every instinct is to try not to upset the majority of people at Plymouth Church who happen to be white by parsing my words, trying desperately to know the contours of your interior lives, especially your fears and anxieties, so that I can be truly accepted as your minister. My instinct is to censor my concerns and misgivings about the summer embroidery so that I won't be seen as too sensitive or too angry or be dismissed as divisive or to be seen as a problem. 
So accordingly, I usually leave discussions like these for white people to hash it out among themselves so that I can mitigate any risk of being a distraction or potentially a scapegoat. I also know that black people, people of color, women have all paid a heavy price for asking institutions to rid themselves of traditions, practices, and privileges for the sake of making the traditionally excluded, marginalized, or even others not thought of truly welcomed into the space. I know from experience that to speak forcefully about changing what is traditional or what has been seen as normal to make room for others is to risk losing the benefit of the doubt that I am acting above all else to protect this church and its future. But make no mistake about it, that is my first goal to protect Plymouth Church's witness, reputation, and moral authority in doing the work of justice. As it is even in our governing policies, the lead minister shall not risk the reputation of the church as an ethical organization of high moral standards within the community. So if you disagree with where I end up on this question, I pray that you see it through the prism of a minister who wants nothing more than to see this church thrive, inspire, and be of service to as many people as we possibly can. I know that I also stand athwart a powerful national cultural narrative that privileges the, his, the triumphant history of a, an exceptional nation whose expressed ideals are to be celebrated, regardless of its stunning, persistent failure to achieve them. Our public and spiritual imagination has been conditioned by normative constructs of race, gender, history, sexuality, and to center the voices and experiences of those on the margins who have been excluded, unseen, or unheard in our churches, communities, or government often feels like a threat to tradition or a diminution of the contributions of our forebears. Making room for the concerns and sensitivities of marginalized bodies can be disorienting. Stepping back and aside creates anxiety as well as a deep sense of loss. But making room for others not thought of, making room for marginalized bodies does not mean that we do not value the community we seek to inhabit. The world is changing, and I know it looks nothing like the world and community in which many of you were formed or joined when you did not have to care about what black people thought or make room for others who did not look like you. Some would argue that to rest the summer embroidery is to turn away from the ugliness of history, to seek to hide the shadow periods of our history when we fail to live consistent with our ideals. Oh, but I am a firm believer that we must face the ugliness and the shadow side of history. We must necessarily amplify the silences that allowed us to deny, evade, and avoid the truth of what we have done and unearth the hidden history of all peoples and periods. I've done so in many places in my life. I visited the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture just a few years back. And I remember vividly seeing the display of iron coffles used to shackle the enslaved and the horrific images of Emmett Till's casket and preserved pictures of the burning Greenwood neighborhood and the Tulsa Race Massacre in 1921. I recently visited the Legacy Museum and the National Memorial of Peace and Justice in Montgomery, Alabama, where 
We saw the names of black Americans lynched in every state in the Union. And we saw the soil gathered from the sites of death and violence. My heart was heavy. The tears flowed freely. And I carried that pain and hurt with me when I left. But that's the important part. I got to leave. I did not have to stay in those places. Because those museums are not my community of faith. They are not the people that I share my struggles, my questions, and my search for meaning. I do not have to see those images day in and day out, week after week, because they are not my community. This is my community. This is where I come. This is where that problematic body, that chattel body, becomes the body of your beloved brother. There's been much talk about history what I found over the years that history is as much the production of history as it is the transmission of knowledge. So it cannot be denied that history, like our theology, comes with biases, omissions, and triumphalism, and is too often presented as neutral and universal. And when privileged and powerful people produce history, or narratives that rely on a subjective historical examination, it is likely that that historical production will be in service to a story that inadvertently silences and misrepresents less powerful people. Not to mention that even in the careful production of our particular history, we have yet to live up the experiences of actual black people whose lives have been touched by Plymouth Church. People like Eliza Winston or William R. Morris, who both in their lives and experience tell that other, more admirable side of Plymouth's history. I'm sure Mary can help you find out all about them if you don't know them. Specifically, the summer embroidery celebrates, through a particular narrative, the First Amendment. But in doing so, it also speaks about and for bodies, especially the enslaved and indigenous body. It speaks for and about bodies in ways that reinforces silences and misrepresentations that black and indigenous people have been trying to correct for many, many years. These representations in the summer embroidery were produced in a context of deafening silences about white supremacy, genocide, and removal of indigenous people, and persistent violence against women. And I do not doubt that the visitors who have seen it, those who are white and American, will be touched by what they see. But will those images move us to interrogate the experiences of the real bodies in our current context who continue to suffer from what violence, genocide, and white supremacy have wrought? What happens to the visitor who sees it? What happens to the visitor after they leave? If nothing happens, what can we say has been accomplished by displaying it? It would not be accurate to say that the embroidery as a historical rep production represents the experiences, the true experiences of black people, indigenous people, or women. But there is another responsibility that Plymouth has that we ignore or deny at our peril. People in this community, institutions with whom we have historically collaborated and collaborate today, and partners in the work of ministry and justice, expect us to lead with moral imagination and radical hospitality, especially during this time of deep and destructive division and polarization. At our best, 
We have excelled at contributing to the needs of others. We have excelled at extending hospitality to strangers. We have excelled at taking thought of what is good and noble in the sight of our neighbors. And we have excelled at living peaceably with all. But we also run the risk of having our moral imagination co-opted by memories, traditions, and historical narratives that cannot make room for black and indigenous bodies and experiences. And so if we are to be transformed by the renewing of our minds, if we aspire to be one body in Christ, discerning together what is good and acceptable service, we cannot hold on to a history whose very construction is founded upon silenced and misrepresented black and indigenous bodies. The one big lesson that I have learned since I moved to Minnesota from black and indigenous people who have lived in Minnesota all of their lives is that Minnesota is a place smothering under the weight of decades of broken promises to black and indigenous communities. Minnesota leaders and institutions have mastered the language of reform, repair and restitution to historically oppressed and underserved communities only to renege or refuse to make good on it. I do not want Plymouth Church to become one more institution promising to do justice, declaring that they will stand in solidarity with those on the margins, but keep falling short and keep breaking faith when it interrupts our own comfort. In my time as lead minister with you, I have rejoiced with you and I have wept with you. There are days that I have come here and I'm very much aware that I still walk around conditioned to see my body as a problem. I felt it acutely when we gathered to honor and mourn the memory of George Floyd as a community. I felt alone and exposed because I was concerned that possibly my community would not know what it felt to know that 10 people were shot in a grocery store because their black bodies was deemed by a young man to be a problem that he had to rid himself of. But then, even as I prayed and the tears began to flow, I remembered, I believe and choose beloved community. I believe and choose Plymouth. And I do so because you did embrace me. A historic first, a risk that you took led by the Holy Spirit and your deep calling as community. And I said to myself, I believe and choose Plymouth. And now I want the world to see us, people of covenant, keeping faith with all God's children. May it be so.